Okay, so welcome to part two of the uh, 455 diesel. So, as we discussed in the last uh, episode, if I can call it an episode, uh, there was a few issues with this. Um, we didn't know if that gasket was blown. Uh, that had a major problem in that the it had been welded in the past and it would not stay in. Um, and the transmission seemed to be slipping when you did try and drive it. So, here is the axle. It is actually out of the transmission now. Uh, I tried fitting this just with a standard smooth clip um, and it just fell out pretty much every time I tried. So what I've done, or what I did, is I took a more industrial type C clip, one of these snap rings, Let's see if we can uh, find one of the same as I used. Yeah, this was the size I used. I got that around the axle. I ground off these two uh, holes that you use your pliers on. And I also had to skim just the th thick a bit very slightly. And that gave me a clip that was much higher than the uh, round C clip that comes standard on most axles. Uh, and when I put that back in, I managed to drive it about seven or eight miles without that falling out. Uh, the reason I've now taken it out is because I had hoped the splines would be good enough for this original axle to work. As you can see, there are splines left in there, uh, but they're not particularly deep, unfortunately. If I get something to... Let's have a look, see if we've got a screwdriver in here. We can measure the depth of that. Okay, so you can see that barely touches anything. There's, there's hardly any depth to those uh, splines. Yeah, if we run over to the truck, where I've got the new axle that was unfortunately the wrong size. I'll be able to show you what new splines do look like. Well, this, by the way, is a uh, a diesel Cherokee, which I picked up for hardly anything. It's only got 70k on it. It's in immaculate condition. Uh, great car, really, for the money, anyway. So where's the uh, end that we want to look at? I'll put the bag back over it. So you can see uh, the condition of new splines. If we can get the screwdriver in as a bit of a comparison. This does have to get back. You can see there's there's far more depth in there. There is a, If I try and move that side to side, there's no movement. <clears throat> Set back over now. And I'll show you inside the axle itself. So you can see in this transaxle, I did grind back the welds further, so now there's no way that the welds are stopping any new spline going in. If we get the uh, ruler, you can see we've got three and a half centimetres, or three, well not even three and a half centimetres there, until it's the end of the plunging joint. And if you find the furthest protruding weld, which is this one down there, I don't know if you can see that. So you can zoom in slightly. We've got almost five centimeters into the diff. So that's not going to cause us any sort of problem. Uh, the splines in there, although they're worn, you can probably hear if I stick something in, they're not worn enough, in my opinion, to stop it working. So you can see we've got a good defined amount of splines in there. Uh, when I do put that new axle in, because the plunging joint end is the same as the old one, uh, I've got hardly any play. So, basically what was happening with the old one, it would work when it was jacked up, but as soon as there was any pressure on it, it would just slip. So this axle would get no drive. I'm hoping with a new joint with my uh, new homemade clip that sticks up more than the uh, factory one, we should be fine. So that's uh, problem number one. Problem number two was that the belt or the clutch case I thought was slipping uh, but as it turned out I did pop this cover off I'm not sure if I mentioned that whether I was going to do it in the previous video or not but the belts, I mean, you can't probably see it but the belt is actually in very good condition in there it's probably been replaced at some point I suspect as when I took the vent cover off it exposed this crack which is, these Polaris uh, covers aren't very well made to be honest uh, they do tend to crack if the belt snaps and hits them so I'd suggest at some point it's had a belt snap and had one replaced, but no. As I've driven it, as I've driven it, it's uh, loosened up, 
It's not slipping at all now. It feels like every other diesel I've ever had. So the third problem I was having, or we were thing we had, was that the head gasket might have blown. Um, as I said in the last video, it wouldn't. It wasn't pressurising. There was no visible signs of water in the oil. Um, after seven or eight miles, I have had some slight hissing around the cap. And when I did take the cap off, the coolant has disappeared somewhat far down into the radiator. So I'm not sure if that was just an air bubble because I didn't continue bleeding it for ages, or whether that's uh, head gasket trouble. If we got the cap in there, is it in there? It's here. If you look at the rubber on that cap, it's slightly perished, but it's not in terrible condition. I would I would expect that to hold pressure, to be honest. So what we're going to do in today's video is we're going to drain the oil and we're going to drain the coolant and we're going to have a look for contamination. Uh, because this is a dry sump system, there's two drain plugs. There's a drain plug on the block, which you can probably see up in there. Yeah, you can. You can. There it is. And there's also a drain plug on the dry sump tank. Which if we go around the other side, we're going to be shaky footage while I get down on the ground. Oh well. There's the uh, drain plug on the dry sump tank. Okay. So what we're also going to do is we're going to take the lower radiator hose off. And we're going to check for uh, oil contamination in the coolant. Now, I suspect there will be some oil contamination. It's, it's not normal as such, but I've often found that. What I'm not wanting to see is pools of oil come out. So the bottom radiator hose on these runs quite a long way. It goes from the other side of the radiator on there, comes all the way back down here and into the block. So what I'm going to do is the easier solution would be to take the lower radiator hose off there rather than faff around the other side against the wall. Okay, so... What I'm going to do now, I'm going to drain the oil, I'll be back when it's all drained. Right, so, we've got it all drained. Um, one comment on these, if you're doing oil changes or anything like that, do them inside, because for some reason Polaris decided to not make a remove of all um, guard underneath. It's actually welded to the frame, so as you can see, the oil drain just literally goes everywhere, so you end up with oil all over the floor, hence a clean-up mess. Um, so this is the oil we drained out of it. <coughs> it doesn't smell particularly burnt. You can tell you've been working with oil when you're latex discolours, can you? Um, but if we look in that, there's absolutely zero water in there. So the head gasket hasn't gone according to the oil. Um, just clean that off my finger. This is some of the water, a sample of the water that was drained out of it. Um, as you can see when I saw that around there, we've not got massive uh, residues of oil left on the side of the cup. So that means that the oil contamination in there isn't high. If we stip our fingers in, look, again, there's no oil residue that's left. A lot of coolant did come out, which leads me to believe that it's not burning it, and so you can't see it at the tailpipe, so I wouldn't think masses is going in. So yeah, I'm not sure really whether it's blown head gasket or not. Um, this water is discoloured by, you know, it's definitely discoloured. The only thing that I thought this potentially could be is uh, diesel exhaust. So it could be just a very, very minor fracture in the head gasket causing some of the diesel exhaust to pressurise the system. Um, and obviously diesel exhaust is sooty, which could lead to this sort of black discoloured water. So... I think what's next is, I cannot decide whether to just pull it apart and do the head gasket or not. Leave a comment what you think either way. Um, but the next video will be either installing the axle and giving it another run, depending on when the axle arrives. Uh, I've got to go through the brakes, so we could do and bleed the brakes. Uh, we could sort that transmission brake out. Uh, what else is there to do on it? Let's have a little thing. Um, the electronics I think are okay, we can just do working out why no power is getting through to the um, lights unless it's driving. Uh, what else is there? Hmm. Yeah, we need to, well we need to shine up the plastics as such, so we need to restore the plastics. What else is left? We investigate the belt and that was fine. There goes the hose brush. Um, there's a UJ to do at the front, so we might do that UJ. 
So yeah, there's plenty to be getting on with. Expect a part three the next day or so. It's just taken me forever to upload the videos. The first part one was 26 minutes long, and it's taken two days so far. And it's not actually uploaded yet, so... Expect some delay between the videos, but hopefully if I film enough, we should be able to get them out daily. Alright, well subscribe if you can, because I'm trying to get up to a thousand subscribers, and once I've got to that point, I'll be able to start using the money from monetization to put back into the channel. I'm not going to spend anything on filming equipment until it comes from YouTube, because... Frankly, I've got too many other costs to be spending on YouTube unless it's uh, paying for itself. Okay, so see you guys in the next one. Cheers.